Hey everybody, it's Jared from Brickhouse Media and Grit Media, and we just finished our meetup on podcasting 101 and 201. We're here at Next Space Santa Cruz in the Pacific Workplaces. I just wanted to go over some of the high-level stuff that we dealt with in the podcast. We did audio record it, and we're going to be sending that out. It's about an hour long about how to podcast 101, how to produce a podcast, and then 201, how to syndicate and share a podcast. So let me go through some of the challenges that we talked about in the meeting. So I'm going to be reading off this board here as we do it. But instead of seeing it backwards, I'm going to just kind of speak to you and tell you. So some of the challenges people felt was, should I do audio, video, or both? And they weren't quite sure. I recommend both. If you can do it, shoot a video of your podcast and do both and extract the audio out. People needed time and support, recommended getting a VA virtual assistant to help them on Upwork and Fiverr. Um, What should they shoot? What are their content ideas? Getting started, the first step is usually the hardest. So if you can just get started, schedule an interview, schedule something, put some accountability to it, send out an email, tell people you're doing it and get some accountability around it. Um, The equipment, so here at Next Space, we have the Cove Studio, which we've helped to um, fill with great media equipment. So that's a good step, but don't get stopped by the equipment. You could have a really great setup for under $1,000 easily. The syndication, uh, we talked about how to syndicate out the content, how to get it out to the world and let people know that you're actually doing these podcasts and these videos. So let people know through syndication techniques. Um, The growth and the data tracking. So how do we check if people are viewing the podcast, viewing the videos? Most of the platforms have good data analytics, so it's not that hard to tell anymore. And then editing your podcast. Editing your video still becomes the number one challenge for a lot of us creators. If you have to, export it out, get a virtual assistant, and get other people to help you do that work. So some of the content styles we went over, these are some of the content styles of your podcast. So what should I do as far as content? So the first one was an interview. Should I do an interview with leading experts and interview them as my style? Number two, storytelling. Should I tell stories about my work, things I'm interested in, or just creative stories? Number three was education. Should I be educating people in the podcast and teaching them something in the actual podcast? Or four was uh, entertainment. Should I entertain people? Just have it be fun. Have it be something that I'm interested in. I just want it to be fun. They don't have to learn anything. They can just laugh and giggle and be silly. Um, Some of the niche categories uh, for number five were doing reviews of different things, services, books, movies, political topics, just talking about what's going on in politics. Um, Something that's value-based, just talking about your values, it goes into religion and personal options, NGOs and nonprofits. And then one person suggested doing a call-in. The key here is, the top of the pyramid here is value-added content. Everything has to be value-added, you got to be giving people value at all times. Okay, and that's how you get subscribers or subs at the top. And the last one was support. So I wanted to make sure that you had support and you weren't feeling like left out. So Next Space has the Cove Studio here. The Satellite in Santa Cruz is also a great production space. There's the Grip Media Creators, our media group and meetup that is here to support people. Craigslist and Nextdoor, Fiverr and Upwork. These are all virtual assistant support network that you can reach out to. Google Forms, Typeform are two different types of surveys that you can give people to learn about the demographics of your users. And then have a website where you're collecting data and you're actually delivering the content through your blog or through your website. So this is what we covered today. All this great content, all these great things. And really it's just about getting started. It's about finding a way to get started so that you don't feel like you're stopped in creating media. So here's some of our channels you can follow us on. So if you wanna do Grip Media Creators, it's gryp.us. If you wanna share a tag, we do do a meetup in Santa Cruz in the Bay Area. This is my email if you need to email me directly, jared at bhmedia.co. And if you wanna follow us on social media, it's BH Media and Grip Media. We're out to support you. We know you can create great things. Don't get stopped by the technology. Don't get stopped by what not to do. Just start something, get the ball rolling, and you'll be amazed what you do. All right, we support you. Have a great day. Take care. On the table, so just email me if you want the digital version of the meetup. Hey, how you doing? Hi. I'm Jared. Andreas. Nice to meet you. We're just going over today's agenda. Okay. We're going to be covering uh, podcasting 101, which is the creation, 
of a podcast, and 201 is the syndication of a podcast, what to do with it after you edit it and it's ready for sharing. Um, any, any top challenges that anybody wants to put on the board that I can address before we get started? Like, what's the number one challenge you have around podcasting? Getting started. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one, yeah. Getting started, okay. Anything more kind of specific than that? Like, what's, is it time, is it content, is it focus? Like, what's the challenge? So let's go through the gear. So this is the Zoom H4n. All of this gear is here at the Cove Studio um, to rent. So as you can see right now, I'm speaking into it. You want to be at least like 10 inches from this thing. Out here, it's going to fade out. So you want to try to get this within about 10 inches of your voice. It has a little cover for it if you're going to take it outside for your own purposes. But this equipment's all meant to be here. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Your seats and snacks. Um, so this is a self-contained recording unit. You don't need any computer. You don't need any wires. It's all built in. Here are the two mics. And you can plug in um, XLR into the back. So it's recorded to SD card. After I'm done, I just hit stop, pop it in my computer, and download it. And I'm ready to either edit it or share it. Most things you want to edit. Um, but you could share it literally straight to your audience. Um, this is about $300 um, and there's links on here and this is a great piece of equipment. You could also mount it onto a camera and use it as a mic that way if you want to do it that way. Or you can plug in a mic on a wire into some of these other ones. But you need the XLR accessories here. Um, we have the Rode mic. So most people know Rode for the on-camera little mics like the point and shoot. Um, they're not point and shoot, what am I saying? Um, the stereo mics that you point over a DSLR camera. So this mounts to a boom arm and you use the screen so you're not spitting all over the mic, but you do want to get close to these mics to pick it up. It also comes with a little tripod stand if you want to do that. There is a boom arm mic in the studio. This is a great piece of equipment. This is only about $30 and I use this a lot for video interviews and it has a dimmer on it. Um, so if I'm doing camera interview and I just want to light someone, you could see it really is a lot. So a lot of times I'll put it off camera and then I'll point, I'll look at them. So it's not like blaring them when they're looking at me if I'm doing an interview. This is also really good if you're doing a webinar and often you're backlit. So you just kind of dim this down a little bit or put it next to you and then you're lit. Because often we've all seen these webinars where you're like black or Skype calls or FaceTime calls or Zoom calls and you're black and you're backlit and no one can see you. So these are only about $30. You can get a battery pack or uh, batteries. It even gives you a little indicator. What's the brand? Newer. Newer. Two E's, yeah. Um, good headphones. Not, I wouldn't use your little earbuds because you actually want to cancel out other things that you're hearing. So I would actually recommend good headphones. Um, this is the Blue Yeti mic. So again, um, you do need to plug these in USB and download these, these two mics. They don't have recording built in, just to be clear. You have to plug them in, and this is a little screen for getting close but not touching the mic. So yeah, so you've, the goal here is that you're empowered enough to not be stopped by the gear. The gear is not the stop, we can check that one off the list, and you can kind of not be stopped by the gear. It's pretty plug and play easy, guys. There's not really anything to screw up. 
There's some mic levels on there and you just want to listen to it in the headphones and see how your mic level is. I always recommend a little bit lower because you can always bump it up as opposed to peaking. It's the same thing with exposure on video. You always want to go underexpose a little bit because you can always bring it up when you edit. If you overexpose it and you crackle it and you burn it on video or photo, it's very hard to come down. So if anything, stay lower and then bring your levels up when you're editing. Um, we just did a video of a bunch of kids and they were like whispering, but we could bring it up. I brought it up 300% and it still held because it wasn't over. It was under. Um, there's a, a variety of like gear on your list. So depending on your budget and what you might need, um, you can kind of go through there. I do recommend like a little Joby stand if you want to put this on there or this on a Joby stand. These are J-O-B-Y. They're made locally actually. Well, the company's local. I don't know if they're made locally. Um, and good headphones. Um, so some people wanted to know about preamplification. That's about powering the microphones. If you're going to use any of these, I think you're good. If you're going to take this to the most professional level, I would kind of probably get a preamplifier to power the microphones. That's like the next level of where to take the quality for audio specifically. Um, it's basically just a stronger signal that's pushing. Um, you want to spend as little as possible, hopefully under $1,000 total. Um, I, I could say you could probably do it for around $500 total between the headphones, the mics, the recording, any lights. You shouldn't have to spend a lot. Or you can use the gear here. Did we do about $900 worth of gear? Yeah, yeah, it was just under $1,000. That was my goal. It was like, can we do this for un under $1,000? And we have three mics here, so you don't need three. Um, I wanted to give everybody a little variety here as people have different preferences. At home, you know, what I recommend is come in and try them. Take them home, listen to the samples, and see what you think. Um, this guy's just great because it's so portable and built in to one unit. Um, if you're going to record at home, definitely soundproof a room. Now, you don't have to use the foam that we used, you can just hang a rug or a blanket on, a, on the wall. So anything that's going to not bounce, this is not an ideal room. This is probably the weirdest room, especially with this like hole where the sound goes in. But um, great time designing it, but sound-wise, yeah. So they make a couple of accessories. One is like a curved um, panel that you just talk into the curve. The other one is just find a corner of your house hang something on the wall and speak into the corner and then put the mic right in front of you there. You don't want a big expansive because it gets echoey. It's just not good sound. Um, so you're going for tight area, good dense sound. You want to clap and see if it doesn't echo, but it's just kind of hard to hear the echo. Um, that's how you can tell. Um, a lot of people asked in a previous meetup, what's good sound? You don't want hissing, buzzing, any kind of background noise kids running around, cars in the background, unless that adds to the content that you're going for. Um, the same thing with videos. If it adds to the flavor of what you're doing, then keep it. If it's super distracting, try to get rid of it. Um, everyone asks me in, in, with the video, like, what should I have in the background? I'm like, nothing if possible. If you ever look at Apple and their launch of new product, it's pure white. There's nothing in the background because it focuses you on what they want you to look at. Um, but sometimes it's nice to add a little flavor and color if it adds value or is it distracting. Um, I put some software down here. So again, the software shouldn't stop you either. It's not expensive. Some of the stuff is free or it's like, you know, a few dollars to just get started with some of the recording software. There's a question about smartphones. Yeah, so if you're going to do video, I would record the audio separately or definitely get a secondary mic than your smartphone microphone. So I wouldn't just use the little guy at the bottom. I would plug in a mic, either a USB mic or a lightning cable mic, depending on which iPhone you have or phone you have, um, to use that. Don't just use the speaker on your phone. Definitely get a mic. Um, so we're talking about audio, so it's like really good to get as clean and close to the person speaking as possible. It's going to make people more drawn in and excited to hear them speak. But the video level quality is acceptable? Acceptable, yes. I would say lighting is probably the most important thing. Um, I shot a video in the studio the other day on my phone, and there's 
two things I want you guys to know. When you're doing um, your camera, you actually can touch anywhere around the screen and it will change the exposure. A lot of people don't know that. Um, if you hold your finger on the screen, you'll get this AEAF lock. And then from there, you can drag up and down and lock the light. So on iPhone that works, I'm not sure on Samsung and Android if that's the same function. So I did this so I could lock the light so I wasn't overexposed and I was exposed for the light in the room. So if you're gonna use your smartphone, lock it like that and then as soon as you hit record, you gotta switch it when you switch from camera to photo or video. As soon as you hit record, it locks. So see how the light is locked wherever I turn the camera? So it's not gonna overexpose you. And again, underexpose because you can always over, you can push it up when you edit. Um, so a couple of tricks about the phones. And we have a ring light in there to just highlight the face of one person speaking and it holds your phone in the ring light. So it's a pretty cool accessory. And I think that was about $70, the ring light, 70 to 100. You can go up in quality obviously, but the ring light is about uh, 70 to 100, the, one that, the newer, the version, same brand as this. It's a good question though. So do we do audio and video? So the biggest podcasters in the world right now are doing both. So if that's the trend, then have a camera, shoot both, and then you can always extract the audio from the video. I think we talked about that, the last one. Um, you can always extract, if you're gonna record through video, just extract the audio clip out and push that to your sound platforms. And then you have a video file. Um, YouTube is changing really quickly. YouTube just started YouTube Music because a lot of musicians will post their song on YouTube with no video, just a cover image. And then a lot of people are actually listening to music through YouTube. So YouTube is getting more into the music, which means more audio. Amazon is gonna have a one-to-one -one platform where we can push our own content onto Amazon for podcasting soon. So they're all kind of getting, and Apple is too. So Apple Music, Amazon, YouTube, they're all going in the direction of more podcasting and audio and being able to push our own video. So if you can do it under challenges, record both. Um, we did this with recently with a, a member here, Iris, who runs co-working with Iris. And so we shot video and we extracted the audio clip for her podcast. So she can actually hit people on YouTube and all the, um, all the, podcasting platforms that she yeah, wants to reach. The skills is, is coming up pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoy listening to that. Yeah. Wired to Alexa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to say, Steve? You want to get a, a lapel mic. So something with a wire that's going to reach you. Um, under gear, let's see. I don't think I put the, the lapel mic because it's based on, are you shooting with your phone? And what kind of phone do you have? Um, but you just, you can use the, the one you're using for your phone calls, but it's not ideal. So you probably just want to invest in a third party mic that plugs into your phone or your camera. Um, but yeah, good question. Um, if you have a Mac, you have iMovie built in or you can get GarageBand for editing. Um, you had asked about editing. So there's no simple solution around editing, except there is a software that is PIPA, and PIPA allows transcription. So I put that on page three under developer platforms. PIPA actually will help you transcribe it into text. So we're going to jump around a little bit, but think about it. If you're going to put your podcast on a web page, you have to have decent SEO, search engine optimization, so people can find your podcast. So if you can transcribe your podcast, that creates a massive amount of keywords that relate back to your podcast. So if you can do transcription, even if you just do a paragraph summary compacted with keywords from your podcast, Definitely do that if you can pay someone or use Pippa to transcribe it. Um, most transcription is about a dollar a minute. So if you have a 60 minute piece, it's 60 minutes, $60. But Pippa actually will transcribe it. It's not perfect software. And there's a couple of other software that just come out. Um, I just met one, Otter AI. 
um, is, a, is a voice transcription software. So you can use it for meetings, you can use it for calls, whatever you want to transcribe um, to text. And then you have this nice tense text transcription. So let's say you want to write a book based on your interviews, there's your transcription already done. Um, so there's, a, there's some cool media hacks that are out there to help um, you know, make this more efficient so you're not trying to do everything just yourself, listening to it, typing, doing all that stuff. As far as editing? Yeah. Yeah, I would get a keyboard and a mouse <laughs> and not try to do a touch. Yes, yes. Yeah, most software is available for the iPad because um, iPads are wonderful in the production world. We use them for teleprompters. We do all kinds of cool stuff with iPads. But you need the accessories to plug into it. Yeah, but most of the software is available. Yeah. Um, so GarageBand is probably the number one Mac program for audio editing. But if you don't want to do that, you can start with iMovie remove the video track and just do the audio track. And you can just have a graphic for the amount of time that you're using. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you just need one graphic to hold the audio. Um, then there's a bunch of other software here with links to see about what you want to use. Um, Adobe Ad Audition is another good one. Audacity is another good one. Um, the developer platforms is more like, okay, what am I going to do with after my podcast or help me support to get my podcast up online. So Podbean, Pippa, Libsyn, SoundCloud, Acast. So these are the top platforms used by professionals. But they're not expensive. Like Pippa is under $20 a month and they include transcriptions. So it's pretty cool. Um, are we ready to move on to the listening platforms? Is everybody good? Any questions? So these are the top podcasting platforms that people push their podcast to. Apple's number one. Apple's not on the list for developer platforms to help you build the podcast. Um, under, yeah, it's under listener platforms. So 70% of the market is on Apple iTunes. So obviously you wanna put your podcast there and have it on maybe a second or third platform. The big guys, they do a lot of platforms, but I don't recommend that in the beginning. It's just overwhelming to try to do so many different platforms. Um, but Stitcher, Overcast, and Apple, and SoundCloud are the top four. And then it just kind of goes down from there. But like we said, Alexa is at the bottom of the list. YouTube, Vimeo, um, Apple Music will be on there soon. So definitely think about things. Um, if you have a larger audience, so when you hit the 3,000 subscribers, listeners, that's like a breaking point that you want to try to hit. Once you hit 3,000, people will actually pay you to advertise on your platform. Um, now, if they're going to be going for niche audiences. So if you've got a really targeted niche audience, that's even better um, than just the general audience. But most topics are pretty niche nowadays. Um, so 3,000 followers and subscribers, people that you have email addresses for ideally, and you can reach out to, which would be great. So that's, as you can see, the benefit of having a website attached to this. So you could get emails, but you could always just have a web form somewhere online too. And just... Um, when I'm looking at this, yeah. the podcast, mm -hmm. Apple, I, when does it start entering into video? Because obviously YouTube has video. Yeah, so these are just the podcasting platforms. Um, yeah, this is audio specifically. Um, but, um, YouTube would be the number one for video. For video. Yeah. YouTube's the number two search engine next to Google in the world. And the resources and the reach are pretty incredible. Vimeo is number two. And um, so I wouldn't mess. There's not really anywhere else to go than Vimeo, which is less branding, less ads. Or YouTube, which is much larger audience, but more branding and ads to deal with. So that's the trade-off. What do you mean by branding? Um, there's just stuff going on all over YouTube. Like when your video finishes, nine other videos pop up. That's other people's branding, ads, other stuff. Ad advertisers are paying for those spots. So how does like Instagram fit into that? Instagram and online. Is Instagram are too short to be considered, okay. too short form to be considered for this. Um, what you want to use social media for is marketing back to the long form content. So, hey guys, I just did a podcast on Santa Cruz podcasters, and we're going to be airing that. Here's our link. 
go over to that website now and watch the full thing there. Okay. So social media is really about getting people off social media to your other branded channels. Yeah. Um, you want to think of social media as kind of like a marketing channel. You're adding value, but it's a marketing channel to bring them back to a website or some other resource. Quick, quick question. Yeah, yeah. So like um, just an online survey form. So something where you can put your name and your phone and your email and your zip code in. So you know where people are, maybe some demographic information, what's their age range. So if you have your zip code, you know where they are, um, their name and their email, so you can get back to them and send them a follow-up survey to learn more about them. So that's what advertisers want if you're going to try to charge for a podcast. They want to know who your users are. So you have to give them some demographic information to try to sell your podcast. So do you recommend having a form before people can even access your podcast, but then maybe they wouldn't want to go through it? If they no, I wouldn't recommend that. Get them to the podcast. Get them content. Um, yeah. Value add always at the top of the list. At the top of the pyramid is always value add. So you're always trying to get them providing value at the top, and then this is your subscribers. Subs. So you're always giving content, giving value, giving value, and then you're asking, well, how about your email? How about your mobile number? And, and mobile is becoming the next thing because people aren't checking their emails that much. The email check-in rates are dropping. But if you look on how many unopened text messages you have, it's pretty low. So messaging is the future of marketing. Emails just kind of lowering, lowering, lowering. But the cool thing is like once people are subscribed on YouTube and other channels, they actually get an update when you release content. So if you're subscribed to a YouTube channel and I release a video, YouTube sends you an email that says, oh, your channels have just uploaded a new video. So you're getting an email from YouTube, not from you personally. And then you can send them a newsletter too. So you can see how this starts to kind of grow from, oh, a podcast, then a survey, then a website, then an email newsletter, then social media. It starts to kind of expand. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an overnight thing. It takes time and investment of resources. But if you're committed and you're producing great content and people are excited about what you're doing, it's worth it, I think. Do you have a question? No, no. I was just very intrigued by your comment that emails dropping. I would just call it messaging because it's, it's going to move away from just text. There's all these other platforms where you can Instagram message people. Ah, okay. So it's just really messaging. It's, yeah, it's yeah. less email, more messaging yeah. is where the market's going. What were you going to say, Susan? I was just going to ask more of you to concur. I concur. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so you're kind of getting media savvy through this process. So now we're going to talk about revenue options. So let's say... You're, you're getting monthly subscribers, it's growing. Um, the data is through the platforms. You had asked about where to get data analytics. Um, it's actually through the platforms that I mentioned. So if you post on SoundCloud or Stitcher or Apple, Spotify, they're gonna give you back data of how many people, how long they listen for. Um, you can see the drop off. So if you've got a 25 minute podcast and everyone's listening for 17 minutes, Maybe you should have a 15-minute podcast. Mm -hmm. So you start to see the drop-off levels. Um, but incredibly, the longer-form content is doing better right now. Mm -hmm. A two-hour podcast is outbeating a 45-minute podcast, which is kind of crazy mm -hmm. because attention spans for everything else are shortening. But for long-form content, it's actually lengthening. So it's really weird. There's like this weird data gap between like 20 minutes to like an hour. And then after an hour, it's actually really long. So I think it's people driving. I think it's people on, yeah. like commuting and road trips and headphones and at the gym and commuting. It's like these, and, and they're sucked in and they're, they're invested. Yeah. It's, like um, right it's like a really good radio program, yeah. Um, and the video, if you can shoot a two hour video, it's incredible. Like the, did anyone see the Elon Musk video on Joe Rogan show? Yeah. Did you hear about it? Heard about so Elon Musk went on the Joe Rogan show. Joe Rogan is the number one podcast in the world. Um, and it was a two and a half hour interview. And, and after about two hours, he smokes a joint with Joe Rogan and he gets completely annihilated. The stock dropped 6%. Um, they were calling for his, you know, to resign as CEO. It was a big, it was a big deal in the podcast world. Um, so, but it was a two and a half hour. So nobody had watched, most people have not watched two and a half hours into the podcast, but it didn't happen until the last 50, 30 minutes of the podcast that he did that.
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, a little podcast drama. Um, so, let me go back to revenue ideas. So, if you can get some ad sponsors, you can reach out to people too, don't forget. You don't have to wait for them to come to you. Say, hey, I've got this niche topic. Do you want to reach my, you know, audience? Um, and typically people do an intro ad or an outro ad. So at the beginning of your podcast, you mention your sponsor. Like a dentist. Like a dentist. <laughs> Get them to write the script, but you read it and you put it in your own voice. Take their, take their script, but put it in your own voice. Make sure you mention how to get in touch with them, obviously the website or however they want you to follow up um, or do it at the end of the podcast or do it twice and then charge them double. <laughs> so I'll mention you twice at the beginning and the end. Um, every major podcaster does this and it's how it actually makes any money. The only, um, the other models are a paid subscriber. So you have to actually use a, a platform like PayPal, Bitcoin, Patreon to send you payments for your as a subscriber to get it. This is uh, in positive America that they do these um, kind of uh, narrated ad, ad lids. Yeah. And it's really annoying. It goes on for like two minutes. Or, or oh, like know. I think Joe Rogan's is six minutes. Yeah. And I just know to now forward six yeah, minutes. I wonder. How funny yeah. is that now? Because everyone knows to just skip It's kind of like <laughs> TiVoing your TV commercials, yeah. right? Yeah. But not everybody yeah. thinks to do it, so it still hits some people. You know, or you're driving and you just can't touch yeah, it. And, are you talking about the promo at the beginning? Yeah, the that's the paid. Yeah, yeah beginning, middle, and end. Zipper, yeah, ZipRecruiter, um, Squarespace on Tim Ferriss's <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, so under revenue options, there is a hack here where you actually have an Amazon wish list and people can buy you things. Mm -hmm. So instead of charging money, people can actually buy you things. Um, this actually came out of the porn industry, which is kind of weird, but, um, you know, it's, it's a way to tax offset taxes too. You don't have to claim it on your taxes because people are sending you gifts. So it's a kind of way to get around and then you could sell it or you could do whatever you want. Yeah. So send me a zoom mic recorder, or, you know, if you want better sound, who knows? Um, so we talk a little about lead generation, um, how to build your funnel, basically, Getting people to know about your podcast, you have to get them to know about it first before they can hear it. So how do you do that? Use social media, use email marketing, other, other channels. Um, you could sell affiliate codes where get 10% off this company that you love um, or have other affiliate partners that you like that are related to your audience or what your topic is. Um, you could also just charge people for interviews. You could, you could charge people to interview them. Like, I will interview you if you pay me $200 and I'll send it out to my subscribers. So it's, it's a, it is a business. So people pay to be interviewed. Um, I work with a company in New York and book publishers pay $6,000 to be interviewed. But it goes out to over 2 million subscribers. So it's a very targeted niche audience and you know it's going to get to them and you pay up front to do it. So it's not a bad business model that way either. Um, there's a local one called Discover Her, and she actually has a paid model too. You just join a membership, it's $100 a year, and then she'll interview as a member. So the interview is kind of a perk, but the membership is the paid part. So if you're doing a private membership site, you could offer an interview as part of it, or an upsell into an interview. So these are all like revenue ideas, because a lot of people struggle with revenue. How am I going to make money for my podcast? The private part? Yeah, where you just said... Um, um, yeah, go ahead. If you, if you can do this as a private thing or something. Or um, a paid option, like an upsell option? Yeah. Um, so you say, hey, join my membership. It's $100 a year. And for $200, I'll feature you on my membership site. I see. Okay. Same so same you're thing. kind of like an upsell price option to feature them as a member on their site. So Facebook groups is a, is a big growing area where people have, you know, they bring on a caller for a Facebook group mm -hmm. or bring on an interviewer. People can pay for that, you know. So it's, you, you got to get your, your audience to a place where you can justify that, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't do that in the beginning. Um, yeah, I wouldn't ask for advertisers unless you're hit like the two to 3,000 average followers. So monthly followers or, you know, however often you're frequently putting out your content. Um, 
I'm not going to do too much in here because this is just stuff you can read about um, as far as audience targeting because I do want to save some time for 201. Um, there's some more general tips, um, podcasting resources, hire a VA, a virtual assistant to help you if you need support. There's Craigslist. There's local kids in every high school and college that want experience in all these areas. So there's programs at most of the schools to actually help you find students to work with that actually, and it's free, and they just want experience. Um, there's always social media next door, the local neighborhood app, if you want to try that. And so I'm going to skip over to Podcasting 201. Can I ask you a question? Sure, of course. Would you recommend, um, I'm just thinking about this, like when I interview people for an article, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times folks will ask, for instance, to read the article before it's published, which I typically don't do, because um, I'm just totally done with the works. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm curious, with a podcast, would you recommend... If they can your, edit it before... Or, or, even, or you have them sign something Yeah, I mean, it's not. A, it's never a bad idea to have them sign a liability waiver of consent yeah. to say, you know, put some terms into it of, you know, what I'm creating is for the benefit of you and I. It's, it can't be considered slanderous or, you know. So, yes, I do recommend. I'm not a lawyer, but, yeah, I would recommend something where you actually have people sign a contract or some release of liability. Right. Um, so they can come back to you and say, hey, you know. I, I'm sure Elon Musk probably wants one of those now. Um, he probably doesn't care. So, um, yeah, 201 is really about, okay, the podcast is done. I have it on a platform. Now, how do I get users? So if you have an email list, then that's great. So I'm going to put that under support. So um, you can use Google Forms if you don't have a website. So that's a free survey tool. And when I say survey, it's just a, it's a web form that people can just put their name and email and phone number into. And that goes straight into your Google Drive account, and it's organized on a data form that you can just email to if you want to send out an email. The other one people like is Typeform, and that's more customizable and kind of nicer looking. Um, same functionality, and then there's always a website. But you can have a one-page website. I don't think people realize that. You don't need... 10 page website. You can have a one page website with an email subscription box at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that costs you $10 a, you know, a year. It's not a lot. So um, email is still number one way to reach people if you don't have a mobile number or another channel. If you have another channel, then text and messaging and Facebook bots and those auto messaging you start to see on Facebook is quickly going to surpass that in the next, I would say, in the next five years. Um, so here's some recommended software We're on page nine, if anyone's, um, here's some recommended email software. Gmail is free. MailChimp is free under 2000 followers. Um, Mad Mini is a very easy layout, drag and drop software. Squarespace is the one I primarily use now and build for my clients. Um, Active Campaign, ConvertKit and Infusionsoft. Those are like high level professional email platforms. But those are the big pro platforms that you see the biggest Tim Ferriss and the biggest followers use. Um, yeah. GMAS? I don't use GMAS. Okay. But GMAS is a way to use your Gmail account to do mass emails, right? right. Yeah. I'm going to put that on here. Thank you. Do you use it? I do. How do you like it? Um, I like it. Yeah, you you it, get to find out who opens your email and uh, what links they click on and stuff like that. And does it allow you to do non-text-based email? So just, not just text? Oh, okay. So that's the difference. Like if I get an email from MailChimp or these other ones, I know it's branded and it has visuals. Whereas if it's from Gmail, it's just text. So if you just want to do text with hyperlinks, then yeah. I think Gmail. Yeah. You can put the person's name on it. So actually, my email is kind of chatty, so it looks like a personal email from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's your average open rate, would you say? Uh, it's 46%. That's great. Okay. And 300 Okay, so as your list grows, the percentage will traditionally drop. The average in the industry is around 20% open rate. And that's been kind of dropped. It used to be 25, now it's 22, now it's 20. So it's kind of average dropping. Um, post your post. If you have a website, create a blog. Mm -hmm. So post it to your blog as a new post. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the platform, you can actually embed the entire player right in the blog. So it depends on the platform you're using for blogging. 
Yes, and they're very good at, um, they actually have a partnership with SoundCloud. Um, so you can actually embed your SoundCloud right into the post. It's a, it's a. WordPress is, but it also has a lot of other challenges around hacking, crashing sites, yeah. themes and plugins that crash sites and create yeah. challenges. So if you just want to have a clean, simple interface, I would recommend Squarespace. And yeah, and they do do blogging specifically around SoundCloud. But they don't, not, so SoundCloud is an audio version of blogging, but SoundCloud... Yeah, yeah, I'm just talking about podcasting. They all do text, obviously. Text. Yeah, yeah, um, and video embeds. Um, so I put some platforms down here, WordPress, number one, Squarespace, Tumblr, Medium, and LinkedIn. A lot of people don't think about Medium and LinkedIn. Um, those are two channels, that, there's professional level channels that you can push out to. And either you're driving people back to your blog or you're putting the content right there. So it's up to you. If you're trying to get subscribers, don't put it there because they can't subscribe there. Um, so if you want them to subscribe, you have to put it on a branded channel where they have to subscribe to get to it. Um, does anyone else have any other recommendation platforms that they push to, or they post on? Okay, well, I left a little space for that. So promotion, so then you use social media to promote your content. So let's say you have a half, what, what, what's the blog topic or podcast topic you would do? Uh, content marketing. Content marketing, okay. So you're gonna wanna create like a little snippet, like today I just did a podcast with X interview. Those are some of the styles of podcasts you can use. I did an interview with X expert and we're gonna be talking about X, Y, and Z. So it's a short under five minute either video or post that directs them off social media to your channel. Not every social channel allows hyperlinking. YouTube just got rid of it under 10,000 followers. Um, Instagram's a little tricky under 10,000 followers to give people a link that's actually clickable. They can copy and paste it, but it's not that easy with certain channels. Now, now Facebook is super easy to post content with links. So that's why Facebook's still number one for that. Um, in the comments, yeah. But again, some people just don't think about it. Yeah, so if you're gonna do that, put it in the first two lines of your description of your video for YouTube. Because then people don't have to click, click to see more. It'll actually show up in the first two lines. So I always put my website address in the first two lines of every video I post. So people can go to the video, or go to the website. You used to be able to click a link on the video and it would go to your website and they got rid of it under 10,000 subscribers. So that's a bummer. Um, Twitter's a good way to you know, create a hashtag around your blog and post it to Twitter and Instagram. They do more with hashtags. Instagram, you could put a link in bio in the comments and put the link to your podcast in your bio. You can also use a software called Linktree. Uh, Linktree creates, I'll show you what it looks like. Um, it creates like a bunch of buttons to your content through um, Instagram. I'll show you what this looks like. So instead of having my website on my profile, I actually have a link tree link. And then when you click that, it goes to a variety of content. So this is like a short form website where people can just click whatever they want. They can watch more videos, get a free PDF, schedule a free consultation. Um, do That's on your Instagram? Yeah, this is the link they get to through Instagram. So this is all that it does. It's just simple buttons to direct them to other social channels, your blog, your, your podcast, wherever you want to drive them to. So again, it's a kind of a, another pro hack of you don't have to just take people to one link. You take them to like maybe five or ten. Um, yeah. So that's called link tree. L-I-N-K, tree. Um, some recommended apps to, to send to all these different social channels are Buffer. Um, I love Buffer. It's a, it's a way to syndicate to mul multiple social media channels in one step. So you put your post in, you choose what channels you want it to go to, and then you send it out. And Buffer means you can time release it. You can send it at 6 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, and just schedule it out. Super easy. Yeah, it's so great. Um, if you're curious about engagement, a lot of people don't know how to track engagement. It's how many likes and how many comments on a post divided by the total number of followers. So let's say you got 30 likes plus two comments, that's 32, divided by 1,000 followers. There's your engagement percentage per post. Mm -hmm. So you're always trying to increase that engagement rate. So that's a simple way to track your actual engagement to see if your content's actually working. Um, 
let's see, partners and advertising. So if you can partner with a company that has like-minded users to yours, have them tell people about your podcast, have them write a blog for them and then put it onto their website and get people to your website. That can be a great growth tip to get more people, you know, reach out to people say, Hey, I have this podcast. Can I, you know, contribute a blog post to tell people about it on their site? Um, find local businesses that, you know, might be interested in your, you, you're, you're working with dentists. Potentially, yeah. So find local dentists that might be, again, that 3,000 monthly listeners or 10,000 uh, subscriber mark is a good point where you actually have some leverage with people. Um, and you can always sell your content. It's a little trickier to say, hey, I've got this thing. Do you want to buy? Um, you know, companies buy podcasts once they get to a certain point and they buy content. So if you've got really good content, I would reach out to all the related companies once you get to that point and say, hey, what are you interested in? Or do you want to market to my subscribers? Do you want to buy the content? Do you want to create an affiliate link from your services that I can share and I get a discount revenue back on sales? Um, Amazon is actually free to create Amazon Associates account. So you actually create links to products. You get a percentage of that sale if they use your link to buy that product. And uh, I've made some money that way with, with clients and our own work. So we're right at 1, 12.59. Does anybody have any questions? I'd like to honor your time today. Yeah. I'm having somebody from Upwork create CrowdSpeak's website right now. Okay. On what platform? WordPress. So if you were me, what kind of plugins would you I'm leaning towards the... I, it's going to have a home. It's going to be one page. One long okay, page. one long vertical scrolling. And it's, yeah, and then a blog on the top. So home blog. It's going to you know, answer all the questions. Yeah, you're welcome. Take my card on the way out if you want. Okay. It's on the, the table over there. So what kind of plugins would you have, um, knowing that I want to base it around a podcast or at least have it? Um, probably Libsyn. It was back on page uh, three. So some of these, so it's not so much the plugins, um, it's more of the transcriptions that are gonna go onto the content. The other one is Yoast, Y-O-A-S-T, because that's really good for SEO. The other plugins, it's all based around your theme and you know other things you're trying to do with the site. Oh, so it's right up top here. These guys, yeah. Um, I don't have Yoast listed here because that's like just a specific why, SEO WordPress plugin. Why Libsyn? Um, Libsyn just it, it embeds easier because okay. um, some of the tools you have to actually embed it's a little bit easier. Okay, yeah, um, but most of the listening platforms embed pretty easily into any blog. Um, you don't have to be too tech savvy to embed the um, the media itself so people can listen to it in your blog. Um, it's usually in the sharing tools, and you grab the code, pop it into your code on your blog post, and you should be ready to go. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty easy on that aspect. Okay. Yeah, so what, what's going to stop you tomorrow? Let's, let's talk about that, because that's really the issue, is like what's stopping the starting? Because once you get started, it usually starts moving. Yeah. I've been really blocked with my own. Oh, that's me. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so, and I think my issue with blogging and podcasting is deciding exactly who the audience is that I'm speaking to. So, like, I threw out content marketing for my podcast. I know that's way too broad. Yeah. And, um, what about for one industry or well, a couple so industries? I'm more is like content marketing for nonprofits or environmental nonprofits, something like that. NGOs, yeah, yeah. So, my um, hold up though is. I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of afraid to jump into that, so I'm wondering with both blogging and podcasting. And video. I, <laughs> and video. Like, yeah. If I were to dive into. Well, have you figured out what style you're going to do? Uh, sorry, what do you mean about what? The, like oh, the oh, style oh, of, so. of the podcast? I think it would be a um, mix. I would definitely do some interviews and then, and then storytelling, I think. Okay. Like, I it would be a mix. No, 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 it can totally be a mix. You don't have to just pick one. Yeah. 
But it is good to get a style like, okay, I'm going to test this, try it. Yeah. And maybe you do a few episodes to give it some runway. So I'm thinking I could start with content marketing for nonprofits, but I very well might pivot. Okay. But Have you scheduled you... anyone to be an interview? Oh, no. Okay. So I think that's going to be the things like once you get the ball in motion and like find someone you want to interview, that's going to push you to be like, okay, so I got to record just, it. Just do it and then yeah. Do yeah. Because the challenge is the starting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, I've worked with people for five years on getting started. It's like, once you start, it yeah. snowballs, totally. but it's just that initial start is the roadblock wall and you just don't do anything. Yeah. It's like this analysis paralysis. Yeah. So you think the first one should be with an interview? No, no, no. I'm just saying for her, yeah, just absolutely. to... If you schedule someone to do an interview, yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so at least schedule it, yeah. interview them, get it out there, get some feedback. Even if you just post it to your own social channels, totally. just get feedback. Yeah. What did you think? How'd you like it? What would you like to hear about? Do a survey. So anytime I work with a new client, we usually do surveying and we try to ask, well, what channels are you on? What content are you listening to? Like, you know, how, what form of time would you be willing to listen to? How frequently, weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, would you want content? So it's just try to get some data going around like um, the users that you're trying to target. What's your favorite uh, form, uh, survey? Oh, Google and Typeform. And what was the other one? Typeform, Typeform. yeah. You know, I kind of found this design. And then I think if um, you mentioned editing was your challenge, just hire a VA or hire a student locally, a virtual assistant. Um, through Upwork or Fiverr or, or don't let that be the barrier because there's people all over the world dying for work and you can pay them not California prices if you don't want to pay California prices yeah or even US prices um, to, to, to not have that be the stop barrier um, to your work Skype is not because it's kind of with Zoom it kind of knocks Skype out it's a, it's a more professional platform. It's got the paid recordings. It just kind of knocked it out pretty quickly. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Multi cameras. I mean, it, it's really much more professional. So I've always been supporting. You're just kind of stuck with what they've got. Okay. Unless you're going to mail them a mic, which some people do. They do order a mic. They mail it to them and then they send it back. There's a company called Borrow Lenses. Um, L E N S E S lenses like camera lenses, and they ship anywhere in the world media gear, and then they ship it back. So um, you could, if it's an important enough interview and you feel like you want to invest a little bit of money, send them a microphone, something easy to use. Obviously, nothing too technical. It's called lenses. Borrow lenses. Yeah, um, and that's actually on the grip.us site. All the rental gear. Okay. Yeah. Um, or you're just stuck with what they've got. But tell them to use their headphone mic at least. Yeah. Don't just speak into the computer. Okay. Get people to use a headset mic if they can at least, at a minimum. Right. Um, and that does become a challenge. <laughs> right. If their audio's low or their signal's weak or... I mean, you could even set yeah. There's also a new service called Open Reel, R-E-E-L, mm -hmm. and you can actually take over their phone and control it like a director. You can change the lighting, the, um, the settings. You can hit record and stop when you're ready to. You can actually give them a teleprompter setting. So I'm working with a client who's doing a global documentary. And so we're gonna be interviewing people all over the world and then take over their phone for the video part so we have some control over the quality. Um, all they have to do is sit their phone down, open the app, and we hit record. And we can control the settings, then we get the file downloaded onto our computer. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's called Open Reel, R E E L. Yeah. I like it too when you're going into the nonprofit world because when um, in the, a lot of times people would travel to places to capture. To do an interview? Yeah. Right. And that's so expensive. It is. Whereas it's such an important thing for people to be able to share their story. The stories. Yeah, I mean, you kind of become NPR at some point. It's kind of <laughs> cool. You kind of become these storytellers online. Uh -huh. right. um, it's really neat. So you've done this already. Well, we, we've already used it, and it's already like, it's really empowering. I mean, wow. to control someone's phone and then get the download directly to your computer, it's like, it's kind of big brothery, but they're <laughs> obviously they know what's going on. It's not like they didn't, it's not like we just took over their phone. Like, they knew they were doing an interview. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were like, yeah, go for it. Send people a 
someone? Yeah. But imagine if you could send them a little video of them. Like yeah, yeah. So you were talking about like, uh, using camera like the video. Do you recommend is there some kind of a thing to hold the camera? Yeah, they make little mic accessories. I didn't bring one. There's one in. The, um, should we go take a break and go look at the studio? Uh, yeah.